If you have uh, some spare time today or this summer, even if you don't have some spare time today or this summer, I hope that you'll read uh, the book of Ephesians. It's one of Paul's best letters. So many uh, tidbits of treasure in there. Chapter 1 is really a great understanding of Paul's theology. Chapter 3 includes one of the best prayers in the entire um, New Testament. And this prayer specifically comes from Ephesians 1, 18, where Paul writes these words. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. As we begin today, I want you to um, contemplate this little truth nugget from Nadia Bolt's Weber. See what you think. She says, what I hear in most churches, in the prayers and in the preaching, is, I guess, true. It's just, in my estimation, seldom honest. Well, as the guy who invented Cliff Notes famously said, to make a long story short, (laughs) channel surfing on satellite radio at one in the morning on the way to pick up your bride at the airport after a marathon day of coast-to-coast delays is quite an interesting exercise. The 70s on 7 on Sirius XM yielded nothing, nada, zilch. Neither did The Bridge, Margaritaville, Classic Vinyl, Classic Hip Hop, Soul Town, in that order. It was no less than that bastion of old school country, Willie's Roadhouse, Channel 59, that spun the vinyl, that in turn spun my soul, somewhere close to Rosecrans and the 405. A farmer and a teacher, a hooker and a preacher, riding on a midnight bus bound for Mexico. One was headed for vacation, one for higher education. Two of them were searching for lost souls. A driver never, ever saw the stop sign. And 18 wheelers can't stop on a dime. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there's not four of them, heaven only knows. It's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind you when you go. That farmer left a harvest, a home, and 80 acres a faith, a love for growing things in his young son's heart. And that teacher left her wisdom in the minds of lots of children. She did her best to give them all a better start. And the preacher whispered, can't you see the promised land? As he laid his bloodstained Bible in that hooker's hand, That's the story our preacher told last Sunday as he held that bloodstained Bible up for all of us to see. He said, bless the farmer and the teacher and the preacher who gave this Bible to my mama who read it to me. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway why there's not four of them, now I guess we know. It's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind when you go. It's what you leave behind when you go. May we see that truth with enlightened eyes today. As our son Andrew is fond of saying, that song just hits differently at 107 in the morning 
especially when two miles previous, I passed a makeshift roadside memorial on the 405, a cross, a photograph, an old, tattered, stained sleeping bag, and a homemade sign. Rest easy, Mitch. You didn't have a home here. I trust you do there. Seeing that sign, singing that song, I thought of an article that pierced my heart recently from Nadia Boltz Weber, the aforementioned one, who wrote City Park Sorrow on the Grief of Strangers. I know nearly nothing of trees, she writes. I can't tell an elm from an oak, so I can't say for sure what sort of tree it was that caught my eye yesterday in the blinking dawn of Denver City Park. What I do know is how its spindly branches bore ornaments of pain, laminated pictures of a young man named Liam, bearing messages like, Liam, your life was a treasure. You are missed beyond measure. Liam, you were the best hugger. Liam, we will always miss you. I took notice, she said, of Liam's memorial tree when I walked by it, and I put my hand briefly on my heart. I've had young man I love also die, and I'm so sorry. I don't know how this young man died, by a car, a cancer, or a hand, maybe his own. But for the past day, I've thought about him, those who loved him, and the grief that led them to decorate a city park tree with messages to their beloved and lost Liam. All grief, you see, is unmistakably particular when it is our own grief. The raw edge of my sorrow will always differ from your sorrow when viewed at close range. But when you step back, the shapes of loss start to fade because they share a common ancestor, from afar, it takes the same shape. Something or someone was and now is no longer. Be it a child, a marriage, a part of your body. We need to be able to say to someone, they were here and they were loved. They were here and they were a pain in the butt. They were hilarious. They were impossible to live with. And also, they were loved. My favorite moment, she concludes, in Cheryl Strayed's book, Tiny Beautiful Things, great read if you haven't read it yet, Advice on Love and Life from Dear Sugar, is when she responds to someone who doesn't understand how, after her miscarriage, her boyfriend and everyone else seem to be just living life, like nothing ever happened. She can't understand why she feels so stuck in her grief while the world keeps on turning. I know why, Cheryl says. Everyone else is living on planet Earth, and you were living on planet my baby died. To my neighbors living on planet Liam died. I don't know you, but I'm sending you my love. Please know that I see you. It's Nadia's way of saying, may the eyes of our heart be enlightened to see what truly matters. When I titled this sermon LAX at two in the morning, I thought immediately of my good friend, my mentor, Bill Ritter's sermon entitled, It's Three O'Clock in the Morning, which he began thusly. It's three in the morning, we've danced the whole night through. It's three in the morning, I love just being here with you. Some of you will recognize those lyrics, Glenn Miller, 1930s. Three in the morning. It's dancing and romancing time, arm in arm and cheek to cheek time. I've been there. So have you. But when most people think about three o'clock in the morning, 
They're not thinking about the best of times. They're thinking about the worst of times. If you can't sleep, three o'clock in the morning is the worst of all times to be tossing and turning. If someone isn't home by three in the morning, it becomes floor pacing time. If the telephone rings at three o'clock in the morning, it's palm sweating time. And three o'clock in the morning is no time to be awakened by that quartet of disturbing sounds, a gurgling stomach, a dripping faucet, a crying baby, a four-legged furry thing climbing in the walls. Three o'clock in the morning is a terrible time to be sleepless, to be sick, to feel lost. There is a scene I hope you'll read this afternoon in Matthew's Gospel, the 11th chapter, beginning in verse 25. You know the story, the story well. In that text, it is three o'clock in the morning, on the sea, in a boat, in a storm. And things are uncomfortable for the friends of Jesus who find themselves in that boat. We know the hour. The text indicates it's the fourth watch of the night. The Romans define nighttime as beginning at 6 at night, 6 p.m., concluding at 6 o'clock in the morning. They divided the night into four watches of three hours each. According to Matthew, it's the beginning of the fourth watch. It's 3 a.m. The sea is actually a large lake. Galilee is its name, eight miles wide, 14 miles long. The winds from the Jordanian plain often sweep dramatically across its surface. If you want to paint a picture this afternoon of rolling and tumultuous waves defying even the best efforts of arm-weary oarsmen to hold a boat on course, then paint away. Throw in some rain if you want, a little sleet, no stars, men retching over the side of the boat. But don't put down your brush without finding a way to paint fear in their eyes or in their throat. Then you will have a picture that's worthy of the story and of the scene. Sometimes Christians, in response to Christ leading, find themselves in the deepest waters and the most troubled seas. Jesus seems to believe that storm centers and not safe harbors are where his followers belong. Harold Bales, who served First United Methodist Church in downtown Charlotte, found himself in something of a storm center when he launched several outreach programs to the poor who inhabited now the fast-changing neighborhood around First United Methodist Church's building. One day, Harold was confronted by one of his more, let's say, refined and more educated church members who had just passed several street people in the corridor of her church. What in the world are you doing, she said to her pastor, pointing directly towards the very dissimilar people that she just passed in the hallway. I'm trying to save people from hell, he replied. Oh, she said, well, that's good. We should be trying to save them. Not them, he replied, us. Whatever you believe about divine judgment, you get Harold's point. We Christians are going to be judged by what we do when things are difficult for others at three o'clock in the morning, rather than on the basis of what we do when things are easy in the serene light of the day. Our faith will be measured, maybe even discovered, when, as the hymn writer says, the storms of life are raging, rather than on those nights when we refuse to venture out for fear that it might rain. Back to our story from Matthew, three in the morning, in a storm, on the sea, once upon a time. Or maybe not so very once upon a time. For a lot of you, this is last night's story, or tonight's story, or tomorrow night's story. For some of you, it's three o'clock in the morning in a relationship. 
For others of you, it's three o'clock in the morning health-wise. Bruised and battered, down, defeated, guilty, grieving. Use whatever adjectives you want. When you're feeling such things, it's always worse in the middle of the night. That's because at three o'clock in the morning, there is no light by which to put things into perspective. Very few people to whom pieces of your burden can be given. A man on a stool hears the bartender announce, last call. As he pushes his glass towards one final refill, he says, I came here to drown my sorrows only to discover they've learned how to swim. It reminds me of that great word picture in the novel Hotel New Hampshire by the great John Irving. Sorrow, if you remember, is the name of the old family dog that dies. Not quite knowing what to do with the dog's carcass, they row out from shore, and in a comedic parody of a burial at sea, they throw the dog overboard. The next morning, one of the family's children stumbles over the old dead dog while searching for shells on the beach, which causes him to announce to his family at breakfast, guess what? Sorrow floats. Indeed, it does. I don't know what time it is for you this particular morning, but I'm willing to bet I've hit one of your vulnerable spots in the last few minutes. I think most all of you know what three o'clock in the morning looks like, what it feels like for you, or when it was that such a moment last occurred in your life. Because that's when religion became more than just this academic exercise. That's when Jesus Christ became someone you hungered after in your heart rather than merely speculated about in your head. Because the bottom line of every religious quest, yours, mine, everybody's, is raw human need. Once on an all-night flight from Melbourne, Australia to Athens, Greece, a professor of hydrology from India struck up a theological debate with Robert Fulgham, author of Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. What was on the professor's mind that night was God. He was troubled by why there are so many different names for God, why one group of God's followers will gladly kill another group of God's followers in the belief they are somehow better serving or better pleasing God. The professor pointed down to the Indian Ocean over which they were flying at the moment. And being a professor of hydrology, he began to speak of water. Water is everywhere, he said. Water is in every living thing. We cannot be separated from it. No water, no life, period. It comes in many forms, liquid, vapor, ice, snow, fog, rain, hail. Whatever the form, it's still water. Human beings give this stuff many names and many languages, but it's crazy to argue over what its true name is. Call it whatever you want. It makes no difference to the water whatsoever. It is what it is. Human beings drink water from many vessels, cups, glasses, jugs, skins of animals, their own hands, whatever. But to argue over what container is proper for water is crazy. Some like it hot, some like it cold, some iced, some fizzed, some mixed with coffee, some mixed with tea, some mixed with scotch, whatever. It still doesn't change the nature of the water. Never mind the name, never mind the cup, never mind the mix. They're not important. What is important about water is the one thing we have in common, thirst. That's what three in the morning is all about, thirst. Whether you're tossing on a bed 
or tossing in a boat. Whether the storm is outside of you or within you, whether you're rowing like hell or recklessly towards it, the only thing that will satisfy is the one who in our tradition is called living water, which is precisely what we get or who we get if the story from Matthew is to believe in the fourth watch of the night when everything seemed hopeless, when everything seemed dark, when everything seemed over, Jesus came to troubled souls walking on the sea. Don't ask how he did it. That's an unanswerable question. It's also the wrong question. The debate about how Jesus could possibly walk on the water misses the point. The miracle has much less to do with the Jesus who comes to us by impossible means than with the Jesus who comes to us at impossible times. When it is darkest, he shows up. When we are weariest, he shows up. When the sea is wide and our boat is small, when we're a day late and a dollar short, or a month late and a rent payment short, when the storms of life are raging, when we're up a creek with no paddle, or our arms are too tired to hold a paddle, when it's too dark to see, when it's too dark to hope, Jesus somehow shows up. That's the promise. So cling to it. But the text also issues us a challenge made evident in where we began in the words of Ephesians 1. May the eyes of your heart be enlightened to see first that promise for yourself and then to see beyond the facade and see people this week who thirst, who hunger for hope. There is a God who shows up at three o'clock in the morning and we exist to make that God a reality by seeing the world around us with God's eyes, by being God's hands and God's feet. If you don't believe your preacher, then believe Maggie. For a long time, Maggie felt poisoned by the church. As a young girl, she'd been abused by people who claimed to be Christians. The Christianity I grew up with was so confusing to me, she said, even as a child. People said one thing, they did something entirely different. They appeared very spiritual in public. In private, they were abusive. What they said and what they did never fit. There was such a discrepancy. I came to hate Christianity. Didn't want ever to be associated with the church. Maggie's a gifted writer. She processed her confusion in the way that writers do best. She poured her thoughts, her hopes, her fears, her dreams onto paper. When I came to the church and to my small group, she writes, I needed gentleness. I needed to see people whose actions match what they say. I'm not looking for perfect, but I am looking for real. I need to know if God is, if God can be a part of real life. Does he care about my wounds? Maggie ended her letter with a poem that she'd written to the Christians who led her small group. As you listen to it, imagine Maggie speaking directly to you because in fact, she is. Do you understand that you represent Jesus to me? Do you understand that when you treat me with gentleness, it raises the question in my mind, maybe God is gentle too. 
Maybe he isn't someone who laughs when I'm hurt. Do you understand that when you listen to my questions and you don't laugh, I think, what if Jesus is interested in me too? Do you understand when I hear you talk about arguments and conflict and scars from your past that I think, well, maybe I am just a regular person instead of a no good, bad little girl who deserves abuse. If you care, I think maybe he cares. And then there's this flame of hope that burns inside of me. And for a while, I'm afraid to breathe because it might go out. Do you understand your words are his words? That your face is his face to someone like me? So please be who you say you are. Do you know that you represent Jesus to me. A few weeks after writing that poem, Maggie made the decision to follow Christ. Her pastor, Lee Strobel, asked her, Maggie, I gotta ask, I'm curious about what happened. What evidence convinced you that the Bible is true? What facts did you uncover that convinced you the resurrection was real? None of the above, she said. I just met a whole bunch of people who were like Jesus to me. Do you understand your words are his words. Your face is his face to me. Everyone you see this week will be asking you the very same question. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.